Yeah, so thanks a lot. Daniel, you wish for uh, this uh, invitation. Uh, Latin America is something important for me. I've spent several years here, so it's part of my identity. And uh, so it's really a honor and a pleasure to be here with you. So the title has been given by Daniel. So basically, so I try to be here. Perhaps it turns out to be a disaster. We'll see. Yeah, so can you see the, yeah. the mouse? Yes. So the idea is, okay, to, to, to do this, travel between phenotyping platform and, and field via modeling and via uh, genetics. Okay. So, climate change are here. Probably there is not much to, to, to say about that. So this is a quite interesting study that has been done some years ago. So we have here uh, the statistics of... Uh, I can have oh. this mouse. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Turns out to be a very bad idea. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so we have here uh, the years. Here we have the year. And these are uh, statistics. Okay, so we can see that uh, there was an increase in the year. And now we have a plateau since uh, four or five years. So this is statistics. Now, if we do that in another way, with uh, here it's not in, in this graph. That you don't have the, the year, but the year release, and this is done with a genetic uh, with a, um, uh, experiments in the field. So, so you have the, all the gen types one by one, and you can compare them. And you can see that the plateau that we have here, you don't see. It here. So the, the, the breeders have done correctly their job, progress continues, but something happens. And this something is environmental conditions. So for some reason, nobody has wanted to, to do an experiment during 60 years with the one genotype. You probably don't want to, to have Nobel Prize if you do that. But we, we can do that on computers. And what you see is if we simulate one genotype for all this time, you begin to have this decrease in, uh, in yield about at the same time as we have in the statistics. So, uh, something happens, and this something is probably water deficit, temperature, etc. So, what happens with drought endurance, endurance to, to stresses? We have to remind that it's not a question of uh, resistance, as we have resistance to, to things. It's something like an optimization. If we want plants that uh, are <coughs> resistant to high light, low temperature, drought stress, they exist, no problem. This is a picture of my last holidays. And uh, you have these little plants that perfectly behave in these conditions. The only problem is that perhaps we don't want to have biomass like that. So if we go to the field, it's another story in which we try to optimize the exchange of carbon dioxide versus water. And we know the terms of this exchange. Whenever we close the stomata to keep water, we decrease the carbon flux. And there is another trade-off. That is, whenever we close the stomata, the temperature, canopy temperature increases. We have a presentation of that. And uh, so you can exchange a water stress for a, um, a temperature stress, a heat stress. So we are in, in these exchanges. So we cannot expect really to have traits that give drought turns, because any trait at the end of the day can be either positive or negative depending on the conditions. So we ecophysiologists are boring people who, who whenever they, somebody asks us a question, we, uh, the, the answer is, it depends. So, <laughs> so I try to, to, to make a model out of this, it depends. So is it good to close tomato? And I was, I was fed up of this question at the end of Congresses of drought. Oh, but yeah, yeah. So the answer is it depends. Is it good to close tomato? Yes. Is if uh, you have a very strong dry scenario, so then you have to shut down, keep water, etc. But now for most crops, it's not useful, and it's better to keep 
stomata open as much as possible to get, uh, get more photosynthesis, etc. So you, for the same word, what stress, you can say either it's positive or negative to close stomata. And this applies to water use efficiency, root system. Who is debating that it's good to increase roots? But it is not always good. So it's interesting to see that in Simit, uh, and in Pani, so two, two good <laughs> representatives here, they have done cycles of selection, and then they have looked at what happened. And it turned out that uh, the drought torrent genotype had actually less root biomass than the non... Why that? If, that, uh, if you have a shallow soil, you had probably better to invest your carbon in something somewhere else, in the leaves, in the, in the grains, etc. Because you, you can stuff more roots here. It's no use anyway. So, increasing the root system is fine if you have a rubbish root system, like rice, which is really bad usually. Increasing root system in, in maize, perhaps, perhaps not, but certainly not by increasing the biomes. And we can continue with it. So, that's the... <laughs> The paper that sits here, it's just to do a little bit of provocation. But you, you can take any trait and turn it out to be a trait for drug turns or for drug susceptibility. We do that in, in classes with the students, they, they, they laugh. Because usually you, you can find a scenario in which a trait gives drug turns. So the problem is not drug turns per se. And Interestingly, uh, this applies to QTLs as well. So a given genomic region has positive or negative effects in different scenarios. That's a very nice work that was done in SFMG in Australia, in which they had a QTL. So <laughs> I will try to show it. So you have it uh, with, a, with a red arrow. And they tested lines with a different this QTL in different places. So they did that in Mexico, actually the place which will be presented afterwards, and in Australia, and in different ambients of Australia. The same QTL turned out to be absolutely negative in some ambients in uh, Australia, the, the most positive. Absolutely positive in Mexico and absolutely nothing in other places in, uh, in Australia. So the same QTL, the same traits, turn out to be different in different scenarios. <laughs> So, okay, we can say, okay, we'll try to test our stuff in a field network, so we can test how things are. That's fine, but we have to remind that in one place, and here I show the, in Montpellier for some reason, uh, the, 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 the rain, and we can have, as everywhere else usually, we can have a very dry year, it's the red one, we can have a, uh, and we can have rain just about every, everywhere. So, when you do an experiment, and I have uh, luckily failed a whole campaign <laughs> of a drought experiment this year because it has rain all the time, and, and, and it was a dry, dry run. So, we have to take that into account in our own reasoning rather than say, yeah, drought is difficult to generate. So, it has to be here, and in one given site, you know that you can have one year will be very dry and another year it will be very very wet and the farmer has to face this situation anyway so a network is a small sample of possible scenarios so the first conclusion here traits have either positive or negative effects depending on the scenario it can be drought etc drought scenarios largely differ between year and sites and the, and the farmer has to deal with that and we don't have worked quite well uh, until now but we want to continue so i have heard the presentation by edit on the third day so about the uh, look at uh, the local conditions <coughs> and i think it's extremely important in our case <laughs> i would say uh, quite, uh, probably quite secure way to waste the public money is to look for traits or genes of drug turns per se. It's, it's quite efficient. <laughs> and uh, we know that we have these scenarios with either very dry or very half dry. We know it's not the same genes, but it's a continuum. So some here we'll select for traits 
of conservative trades, some year we'll select for. So if we try to accumulate trades for Brown, so I have, yeah, I have one, two, three, four, when I have ten, I have my joint tolerance plan, it doesn't work like that. Because each trade has trades of a uh, given scenario, so what we actually want is to uh, look for consistent strategies. So if we want to be conservative strategies in, in dry scenarios, let's be conservative. If we want to continue growing, but if we mix everything by putting trades of drought terms, we end up in a mess and it works very well, it is a mess. Okay, so the strategy I will try to show is the genetic variability of the response of trades and to try with modeling to simulate yield from trades in hundreds, not tens, but hundreds of scenarios. So this poses the question how trades are connected to yield and how to measure them without uh, confusional effects. And this is fantastic. So sorry for those of you who know that uh, by heart, but probably it's useful to spend five minutes in how the yield is created. So basically, the field is something that converts light into biomass. So we have two key parameters. One is the ratio of intercepting light or the incident light. So you have here a maze canopy and you have some light that comes in the soil. Everything that comes in the soil is lost. So how, how efficiently my canopy takes the light from up. And you have a second famous ratio for ecophysiologists that how I transform an intercepted light into a biomass yield. So we can write an equation. Biomass is a sum, it's of a duration of intercepted light, time how I intercept, I intercept this light, time how I convert it into a biomass. And then we can continue to dissect and dissect into single traits, provided that all these traits can uh, be uh, put together to, to, to make it. And the interesting thing of phenotyping, a lot of stupid things have been said on phenotyping, so I'll try to make some, some order here. I think probably the, the, the best use of phenotyping is that we can now measure these traits on hundreds of gene types. So we have here a platform that we have in Montpellier, so we have 1,800 plants together. They move, they can be watered, they can be imaged. So here is the imaging system. We take 30 images per plant, so the plant moves and we take pictures. So we have a 3D plant. And from that we can calculate uh, leaf area, bio volume and several things. So you have here three plants, so it's decently reproducible. And instead of having three plants as we did in the old days, we have 250 or 300 gene types, so we can have, we can do with 250 gene types what we did before with 10 gene types. Good. So, what we can do with that? One of the things we really wanted to do was to uh, measure this intercepted light and radiation use efficiency because this is key parameters for a gene type. So what we do, we have here four genotypes with different architecture. They are more or less erect, more or less uh, leafery, etc. So we have our 3D plants, so we can see how our plants intercept light. Actually, it's not possible to do that directly. We do that for those who are interested by uh, splitting our... This is the canopy in the, in the, in the down part of the, of the image. So we split our canopy into voxels and calculate what is intercepted in each voxel. But basically we can measure the intercepted by each plant. Right? So we do that in our canopy, but we have to remember that uh, the light in a greenhouse is not at all uh, uniform. So we do um, mapping of light. But our, our light, don't, never do that. Our, our greenhouse is quite good. But still, you have a map of available light here, and you can see that there are differences in 10%, about 
amount of load. So that's depressing, but we can take into account, and if we take into account the architecture of plan and the local light, then we can calculate the amount of light that each plant on my platform has intercepted. And if I can calculate it, because of biomass, I can calculate also the radiation use efficiency, which is the ratio of the, the amount of light that has been intercepted by the plants to the biomass. So I can do that for each of my genotypes. So the model I showed before, I can use it for 250 genotypes and begin to, to, to model things. Okay, so we can do something similar in the field. We are developing the techniques for that. And uh, essentially we can measure plant height, leaf area index, um, intercepted light, number of spikes, etc. So, and we are trying to work on more detailed traits of the growth, for instance. So you have uh, the, the growth of your plants. I don't, I don't know if you see them. Turns out to be a very bad idea. <laughs> and so, so we have our plants that are growing. They are not growing, but they should. Yeah. Um, so we have our plants that grow. We have a model that uh, shows how the plant is growing in 3D. And from that, so we can calculate the length of each leaf or organ, etc., and calculate the growth, individual growth of, of, of um, organs. Okay, so we, we have sim a similar equipment for areopsis. I go fast, we can follow the growth and uh, in 3D, etc. And uh, there is a platform, actually, the, the data I will show will come from this platform, essentially. So here we, can, we have displacement transducers, and we can measure the growth with a one-minute definition of 600 plants and see how it grows over time. So we can do that in the field, we can do that in the platform, in growth chamber, and we have the growth, and I will show results about that. Good, and finally, we can phenotype in the field, and we have a network of experiments in the field with uh, 332 in environments, the same hybrids, and we do things in the greenhouse. So the take-home message of that is that it, it's very fashionable lately, last year or two, to oppose, yeah, field is good, platform is bad, that's it, religious. So, well, before the platform went, where the, the, the heaven, now they turned out to be the hell, okay. So, I think it's sick and shallow. Actually, the, the, the real question is what we can do with all these platforms, can we... And, and it is interesting, actually, and this is one of the ideas of DROPS, this project, uh, European project that Daniel mentioned before. So, we have the same genotypes in different platforms and trying to see how it works, whether we can use the platform, the field tapping platform in, in Green's house to better understand what happens in, in the field, etc. So again, this idea that there are good platform and bad platform with uh, some criteria that uh, was given by somebody up here is probably seen. And the second big take home message that probably you cannot see because it was too long, uh, the work begins once the image has been taken. So it, it, it's relatively easy to take images, to take data, but then what do we do with this data? And that's the real work. Good. So overall, it's a big data strategy. So we have a terabytes of data. We'll soon uh, have our birthday with the first petabyte and so a lot of data. So it's good to test genetics of traits, that would be very difficult to, to do otherwise, uh, test relevance of potential mechanism and avoid confusion effects. So, what do we do with uh, all these huge datasets? So, it's uh, my own view. Other views are possible. But it's, uh, it's a focused approach. So, we are measuring model parameters, as I showed you before on hundreds of genotypes, then we study the genetic variability, light interception, radiation use efficiency, leaf growth, blah blah blah, blah. and then we can simulate our genotypes over uh, our network of experiment, and we do of course the experiment in the field to, to test, but uh, all of that is crap and out, and usually it turns out to be crap, so, so, so we work out the models again, etc. 
So I want to uh, show two examples of that. So uh, how we dealt with a plant response to temperature, very old problem, and how we dealt with a plant response to water deficit with essentially with this strategy. So first, temperature. So temperature in, in, in the set of equations that I've shown before. Temperature essentially works on duration. We know that if it's warmer, the, the, the cycles, so everything shows down. And it works on rates. Duration and rates turn out to be the same thing, essentially. Right, so to our own surprise, we have tried to test several uh, processes, developmental processes. So leaf elongation rate, cell division rate, uh, germination rate, duration of the reciprocal of duration of phases, and try to put all on the same graph. So there was a trick. So we say that at 20 degrees, all these pro pro processes are one, so we normalize everything at one, and see what happens. And you see that everything has essentially the same response to temperature. This is both extremely original and absolutely not original. Uh, it, original because it, it's difficult to imagine how all these processes can be coordinated. Absolutely not original because it, this is a basic hypothesis of all crop models for the last 30 years that have been worked uh, on this basis. And if it did not work, probably it should have shown for a long time. So, so it's both original and non, not original. The thing that is more original is that we have tried very hard to show that uh, that's maize, but it was the same in, uh, in other crops, that a tropical maize, a maize from northern Europe, etc., have different response to temperature. That's what the intuition would say. And it turned out that they had exactly the same response to temperature. So you take a tropical maize that comes from Nicaragua or wherever, you compare it with, uh, with something from North Canada, and they turn out to be, have the same response to temperature. Good news and bad news. Good news because if we want to model it, it's simpler. Bad news, how it works. It's the strange thing is that I said that we don't have any genetic variability within species, so tropical maize, tropical uh, northern maize, indica rice, uh, Japonica rice, etc. work the same, but between species it's very different. So we have tried to figure out some, some theories out of that, that's not the point today. The point today is that we know this curve, so you have the curves for several species, we know that they are reasonably stable, so we, we know that the maize at 20 degrees behave like that, and if it behaves like that at 20 degrees, at 30 degrees it will behave like that. So we can actually correct for temperature. So we measure something at 30 degrees and we can figure out from these curves, okay, but we are here at 30 degrees, but if we were at 20 degrees it would be like that. So we can in this way normalize everything as if it was at 20 degrees. Again, it's original but not very original because many of you work with degree days and degree days is the same idea, in, but in degree day you, you accumulate degree days assuming that the relation is linear. I, I got tired of this linear relation because everybody fights whether the, the threshold temperature is 9 or 9.5 etc. So we thought, okay, let's consider it as it is, so it's like that, and work with the days at 20 degrees. But basically the same idea. Good, so I will show how we can use it in the edit way of thinking, how we can use this knowledge to interpret what happens in, in my experiment, uh, in experiment of uh, Europe. So here we have thermal time, so days at 20 degrees, versus phenotypical stages, number of leaves, and you can see that we have an experiment in winter, we have an experiment in summer, there is another in March, they work exactly the same, the model works, we know that, we have known that for, for time. Now, we have asked one of our partners uh, to, to do the same, but in the field. And you can see that they, they collected leaf number in the field every second day, and uh, the field works exactly the same way. 
and we ask all the partners to do that sometimes during the year and over this whole network of experiments. And it turns out that uh, essentially it works the same way. So the, the final problem, that the, 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 number, the, the, the stage that I can calculate in my platform can be used for calculating what happens in the field uh, at any place just out of the, of the meteorological data. And in, in fact, in the platform, I don't have one genotype, I have 250 genotypes, but what is true for one genotype is true for the other one. So finally, I can calculate in each of my places the window, for instance, of flowering time without any data, just meteorology and what happens in the platform. I can know when is the window of sensitivity of flowering and then begin to see whether some are more sensitive than others, etc. <coughs> okay, so here, duration of cycle and temperature. Coordination of temperature response of developmental rates. So it's coordinated. I don't discuss why here at the time. And there is no genetic variability, so we can use that for local condition for expressed time versus uh, corrected for temperature and calculate windows of sensitivity. Okay, and this is an example of using the platform to analyze the field again. Opposing that, it's stupid. Good, so I will go to water deficit. And we have here uh, rates and sensitivity. The, the, the first thing that we have to remind, we more or less think growth in two ways. It can be accumulation of biomass or it can be expansion of organs. And if you like, if you look at a given day, uh, you have light here, transpiration is here, photosynthesis is here, and leaf elongation rate is exa follows exactly the opposite trend. So expansion, you, you see your, grow, your leaf growing, expansion is essentially water, and it's <coughs> nothing to do, at, at short time scale, it has nothing to do with the accumulation of carbon, because <coughs> the trend is exactly the opposite. So when you accumulate carbon, you don't grow, when you grow, you don't accumulate carbon. Okay? So it's two processes that have crosstalks, but that are really different. Okay, so I'm saying on rice and on neurogosis. And of course, if we take early days, today versus yesterday, so yesterday, uh, high light, high transpiration, uh, high photosynthesis, and today we have low light transpiration, and the growth is actually better maintained although the photosynthesis is less. So it's different. Good, and if we look at a uh, uh, window of time, so the first uh, hours of the day, we can see that the half times are about 20 minutes. So you have in the early morning, okay, you have your transpiration that increases and uh, leaf growth decreases in, in about 20 minutes. So it's something extremely rapid that follows actually the stomatal conductance. I will not go into details on that, but it's published. By the way, it's published by a, a Brazilian guy who is extremely gifted and is back to your country for the Brazilian part of the assistance. And if you can collaborate with him, uh, he's really a great guy. And now, same idea. I said it's extremely rapid. So now imagine the plan that is really, really sad. You have a picture here, so it, it doesn't grow, leaf water potential minus 1.5 megapascal. So the only, if you look at it, the only question you ask is whether it will die now or a little bit later. Now, you rewater it, turn off the light, so all conditions become perfect in one minute. And the, there is a complete recovery of growth in about 20 minutes again. So, growth has to be seen as something extremely dynamic that changes all the time. So, everything that is uh, transitions, the cloud uh, that uh, changes, etc., has to be taken into account. Not, we are not interested to, to know what happens every, every minute, but it has to be in our mind that it's not something long term, it's something extremely rapid. So, we try to understand what happens 
with some uh, so leaf water potential that essentially uh, follow this trend. Uh, slightly slower, but I don't go into detail. The hydraulic conductance works the other way around, so the plant tries to maintain growth. Sorry, to uh, inverted commas. Trying to maintain growth by increasing hydraulic conductivity and pips, but it's not enough. Now, if we put now continuous light, so the plant is now under continuous light here, but it thinks that it's night here and here, and we st still have this alternation of growth, still have this alternation of leaf water potential, of hydraulic conductance, of heat, etc. So uh, there is an endogenous rhythm for growth that is depending on hydraulic conductance, and that is entrained, in fact, by what happened before. So this green line is uh, the plant was entrained instead of having large day-night intervention, as, as in uh, nice days. Here we simulate, it was actually a horrible day, and if the weather is horrible, then the alternation is less. I don't go into detail, it will be published soon. So there are some ecological advantages of that, but uh, I cannot go. But what I want to say here is that growth has to be thought probably as hydraulics, not growth in terms of, uh, of carbon. There is a crosstalk, but it's largely independent and largely independent of, on time scales of days or, or weeks. Good. So, because I'm a modeler, I wanted to, to know whether this makes sense. So, to be short, if we do a, a model in which the water flows from the soil to, to the, the, the compartments of growth, etc. So, I don't go into detail, but the model can capture what happens. So, a model is not just a question for playing, it is playing, but it's to test whether we have decent ideas. And, to, to, and the model could capture the fact that it's very rapid, that uh, the change in growth is more rapid than the change in water potential, all these sort of things. And the model could capture also the interest of uh, alternation of hydraulic conductivity with certain rhythm, etc. So that's the first type of model in which we try to see whether our ideas make sense. If we can reproduce that in a computer, this doesn't mean it's not crap, it can be crap, but it could be like that at least. So I can make a system, and believe me, sometimes you have your bright ideas, you cannot make any system at all, it just doesn't work. Good. So, the partial synthesis of this, of this is that growth is a mechanism per se. It, it's difficult to defend this idea because many people see growth as a consequence of everything else. But uh, in our hands, it's something that is first extremely dynamic, extremely rapid, probably linked to xylem water potential. I didn't go into detail. Uh, time constants of minutes, not hour, not days, not weeks, minutes, and uh, stress-induced oscillation of circadian. Uh, have uh, hydraulic conductors. Good. So now uh, I announce you, okay, we have our system and of course the question we ask is whether there is a genetic variability. If for temperature for instance we have seen, okay, no genetic variability. If there is no genetic variability, there is no QTL, there is no breathing, etc. So is there a genetic variability here? So what we did was to collect all this data from different uh, platforms <coughs> And put and do meta analysis like that. So we have here that BPD is uh, the air drought. So if here the air is very dry, here the air is uh, very wet. Here and here we have leaf erosion rate. So even if plants are very well watered, if the air is dry, the growth decreases. And if the air is wet, sorry, if the air is dry, the growth is low. If the air is wet, the, the growth is high, and you have something like regression. And we can draw that for different uh, gene types here. And here we do have a very large uh, genetic variability, and we do have decent heritabilities of uh, 0.8 or things like that.
like that. So if we have genotopic uh, variability plus heritability, then we can do QTLs. We do the same for this was in well water plants with dry air. So now we come in the night and see the effect of dry soil and we have essentially the same thing, so we can do genetics out of it. And if, again, if we have a genetic variability, so we have map three <coughs> mapping populations, plus uh, near the isogenic lines, etc., so we can have QTLs, so part of the genome in which uh, we have this determinism of the fact that I continue growing or I stop growing. Okay, so we had about nine quite interesting regions in the maize genome that we are that are largely, by the way, common between dry soil and dry air. So it's probably another argument to, for hydraulics. And now we are working with a Syngenta a region, in a genomic region of a one megabase, so quite small, that maintains growth. So we are now at probably. 50 genes, and hopefully we'll get the gene around uh, soon. So, next part of the approach. Okay, there is a genetic variability, but until now I've shown to you that the leaf number six of maize has a genetic variability for its uh, response to drought. I get that nobody is very interested by leaf number six of maize. So, does it actually represent anything? Or uh, can it transfer into yield? Or is it just a toy for stupid researchers? So the first element is that growth, as I said, growth is growth. It's, it's, a, it's a mechanism per se. So the question was, okay, if we measure growth of leaf number six, do we capture part of the variability of growth of other organs? So we have here two examples of a chromosome with QTL. So we have here, for instance, a, Q, uh, a nice QTL of a leaf elevation rate that we have tested uh, with uh, different uh, near isogenic lines. But if you have this QTL, it's also a QTL for silk growth, so the, the, the style of the plants that, are, that go out during flowering time. Here, dry white, uh, the, chain, uh, the, the, the delay of flowering between male and female, shoot dry weight, etc. Even dry, uh, in another QTL, we have a collocation with roots. The allelic direction is shown here, so it's not rubbish data, it's probably hopefully correct. So the idea here is that if I have a QTL of with growth and response of growth to water deficit in, in a given leaf, it gives me information of the genetic variability of the growth of other organs that do interest me, like six, ear, etc. So, uh, we have here another study in which we have our QTL in the platform, QTLs of growth in the field, but uh, measured uh, in Asia. So, this is essentially six, this is essentially year, uh, leaves, and we have a quite decent genetic correlation between uh, the sensitivity in, in, uh, of leaves versus the sensitivity of uh, silks. So, yeah. And silks respond quite heavily to water deficit, just about the same as I explained for, for leaves. So here you have the effect of water deficit on the growth of silks, so if you have a water deficit, the silks are growing more slowly, so no more. But you also have this alternation that I've shown in, in, in leaves, and for instance, if you measure other days, you have this alternation of night, high growth during night, low growth during day, and if you increase your air drought, APD, the alternation becomes bigger. So, essentially, now we are in a reproductive organ, but essentially it's an organ that grows and follows the same rules. So, that's again the case uh, for water deficit. And we think that it's extremely important because uh, it's an unpublished paper now, but it will be published soon, hopefully. If you review it, please be kind. <laughs> um, 
We have here, in the maize, we have cohorts of, of uh, grain. So these cohorts here are mm -hmm. older than this one, these ones are younger. And so over time, the silk appear. This is in well water and this is in uh, water deficit. And to make the story short, the kernel number that we find at the end is just about the same as the number of sheep that were out. So what I showed you, all the trip from leaves to silks with the genetic variability and then the fact that silks are growing differently under water deficit, etc., turns out probably to be a major determinant uh, of abortion, of what we, get, what we call the tip kernel abortion. So I know that uh, we are in Argentina and that uh, intercepted light uh, is considered as being a major effector of, of, uh, of abortion. This is just to uh, probably I have no time to go into detail, but this is just in order to say that in water deficit, the, my intuition says that I have less carbon in water deficit because there is less photosynthesis, but it turns out to be the opposite. And again, we showed that very nicely in, in some flower. We have the same in the reverses, etc. More often than not, you turn out to have a, if, if the water stress is not horrible, you turn out to have more carbon in a water deficient plant, just because the, the growth is less. Photosynthesis is less affected by growth, so you have to put uh, maintain carbon in a smaller volume of water, and you finish with uh, more carbon. So, just in one word. The amount of sugar was just about the same in well water or in water deficit, actually a little bit higher in water deficit. And uh, most we did uh, enzyme activities, of a lot of enzyme, we did the transcriptome and everybody says we are okay in carbon. So I know that uh, the, the conventional wisdom is that uh, uh, we're, Abortion, the water deficit is carbon, but we tend to challenge that. Uh, we can discuss about that afterwards. So, if all these ideas of my platform capturing something that is valid in the field, perhaps I can have correlation between what happened in my platform and what happened in the field. But of course, if I try just to correlate the uh, the yield in the platform, the yield in the field, it will be a disaster. So what, what we tried to correlate, we had two ways of looking at sensitivity. So I showed you how we get the sensitivity of uh, leaf growth in the platform with these, uh, with these uh, corrections. And we can do something similar in the, in, the, in the field by having the grain number of water potential. So we do correlations as well. And see the slope of this correction. This is published in the European Journal of Agronomy. And it turns out that the correction is not huge. We cannot expect to explain everything in the platform with plants uh, that are high like that. But you can see that. And uh, it was a, a study with the Limagra, actually. And uh, the, the take-home message, uh, at, the, at this stage, we can identify who are the stupid uh, genotypes, who are the more or less interesting genotypes and what is the, 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 the general feeling. And so it's something that can be useful for breeding and we is actually uh, testing these ideas now. So, again, saying that, well, the platform are for being people who want to publish in nature and the field is the real stuff, that's stupid because we, we can actually use what happened in the platform to study better the field than the other world. Good, and finally, uh, that begins to be old stuff, but we, we are continuing in this uh, idea. If you have followed me, and that we can model the yield in all these uh, changes of, uh, of scales, so then if you have a QTL of a given trait, you can stuff it in a, in a model. The, your model of QTL will tell you how your leaves are growing, are 
with a QTL of a sensitive response, it will be less, etc. Mm -hmm. You can stuff it in a hole and then test in hundreds of situations uh, whether uh, the, the yield is affected or not. So here you have two QTL that look about the same but have different effects, etc. So the, the white QTL turns out to be positive in about all situations, while the black uh, QTL appears to be negative in some situations and having a small positive effect in others. So this can allow us to uh, simulate the genotype by environment interaction and if we have a combination of values, try to see whether it will be useful in, uh, in Hungary or, or in northern France, etc. Good. So, conclusion. So, the big messages. I think, again, uh, the question is not does this alien bring drug terms? Because this is not a question. Uh, if you want to publish in nature, just uh, make very small plant, there will be extremely tractors believe me. So this is free experiments published in nature. You, you, you put nice transgenic out of it, but uh, the story this one. So the, 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 the question is, in which scenarios, how often, what are the trades off, etc. And for that, it's useful to do um, so again, we don't want to accumulate trades for the returns, like my pig with my... But we want to build consistent strategy for our given regions. So Ali is for stomach control, growth, cycle durations. Make something decently consistent. So uh, the, the, the general approach that is used in phenom, in drops, etc. in all the projects we are carrying out, is to try to identify the genetic variability in platform for key traits in yield for yield for in field for yield etc. and try to link all of that with the models and with phenotype. So I, I try to show that in two examples: temperature and water deficit. So temperature response are coordinated without genetic variability. And again, for modeler, it's extremely good use. Because if the response to temperature was different between, between genotypes, then our life would begin to be difficult because you would have to correct time or temperature differently for each genotype. This would be a mess. So, not genetic variability, so no possibility of breeding either. And for expansive growth, perhaps it's a change in thinking. It's independent of biomass accumulation, so there is, of stock, of course, but it's basically independent with. Uh, feedbacks. It's probably linked to open hydraulics with a circadian rhythm and uh, with a large genetic variability this time. So we can do something with the genetic variability, which is not really used until now. And with this genetic variability being partly coming between all. So I think that all of that can help us to build either types. And finally, really, I want to push on this idea of local conditions. To some extent, it, uh, you said that, well, but we should still do that, but doing basic science, but still do that. I think this is a potent tool for doing, actually, uh, basic science. But here comes the money, because if you want to have the local and take into account all the local conditions, then you need some, some part of money. But, Again, I think this idea was absolutely essential. Preguntas para François. Sí, te digo. Yo me había quedado en la prehistoria con la congelación entre aborto de granos y actividad de invertazas apoplásticas. Y 
¿En qué momento eh, las midieron y si encontraron que no existe ninguna correlación en ningún momento con la actividad plástica de Invertasa? Este, en realidad hay diferentes tiempos para aborto. Y hay un aborto ligado al cabo que empieza un poco después de lo que describo acá. Pero sí, no sé si se acuerdan de las fotos que John Boyer ha publicado. Oh, sorry. <risa> claro, sí, donde eh, muestra que... It, 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 it was messy. So, it recovered with the sugar, but it was messy. So, it was an abortion all round. While what we describe, the tip kernel abortion, and I think both exist, but John and Chris in some mind, etc., tried very hard to avoid all sorts of other processes, especially the, 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 the common uh, date for fertilization for everything. I will not explain to Maria what happens, but uh, this. So it exists, but we think that uh, the, the main cause of abortion to water deficit is before that and is carbon independent. But carbon dependent abortion exists. ¿Hay una pregunta? Hola, buenos días. Una consulta. Si no me perdí, en una parte no hubo diferencias entre la, en el contenido de azúcar entre la sequía y los controles de ojo río normal. Eh, ¿Evaluaron la, el, la partición de, del aporte de la planta al, al grano? ¿Sí? ¿Qué contesto? ¿Catero? Si quieres. <risa> eh, sí, es que usualmente lo que pasa es que cuando das un, uh, un estrés que no es un desastre y una vez más los estrés de Boyer eran un desastre, o sea, muy, muy fuerte, la fotosíntesis está afectada, pero no mucho, y, y el crecimiento está afectado mucho. O sea que finalmente, una vez más, lo, lo que traté de explicar, tiene una bolsa que crece más en uh, que crece que continúa a crecer en water déficit pero menos y pone azúcar si el, 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 la cantidad de azúcar que tendrá en su en su bolsa va a depender del crecimiento y, y, y de la y de la fotosíntesis la fotosíntesis no está afectada tanto y el crecimiento está afectado mucho tan que al fin y al cabo la cantidad de azúcar puede ser incluso mayor en water deficit. So my question is more regarding the correlation between uh, the greenhouse conditions and the field uh, and, the, and the temperature response. Because usually when you have high temperature in the field, you also have a drought stress or some sort of a water stress. Did you include those in your greenhouse conditions as well? Uh, actually, uh, we asked our partner to have a somewhat managed stress. It was not really managed, but essentially the stress was during flowering time and not too serious afterwards. So otherwise probably the correction would not have worked because we cannot, of course, account for the effect of uh, the rain filling with the growth of leaf number six. But so it was a water deficit during flowering time when everybody believed the, the, the maximum sensitivity. So in this case it worked. If, again, if we had had the fields with a high water deficit, very late water deficit, the correlation would not exist. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but the, what you showed is mostly 20 degrees, right? Sorry? Uh, what you showed was mostly 20 degrees. What happens at higher temperatures? Okay, so we are not talking about the same thing. No, I was okay, 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 so, so, sorry. Okay, this was the phylochrome versus temperature. Okay, so we have the phylochrome uh, in the greenhouse. So, of course, it's not at 20 degrees, so the temperature changes all the time. But the trick, the, the trick is the same for degree days. It's exactly the same trick. You correct your time for temperature. So I'm a uh, homeotherm, so I'm 37 degrees regardless of temperature. For a plant it's not the same. Time is longer if it's cold, it's quicker if it's uh, rapid. So we, we express everything as if the temperature was 20 degrees. So in the field and in the greenhouse, the temperature was moving on the 
but we, we express everything as if it was at 20 degree days in the centric models. And in this way, if you express field, platform, second field, etc., it works uh, the same way. Right, and that's exactly where my question was coming. Where did uh, water stress come into that correlation? Yeah, water stress uh, increases fire problem, decreases the speed of uh, appearance of leaves. But, uh, okay, so you, you are right. The idea is to take first into account the effect of temperature, because temperature is first. <coughs> temperature will mess up all our data, so first we have to take into account and then uh, we consider the effect of water stress as, a, to some extent, a residue after that. So that's typically what we do for lean growth, and that's what we do in Paris. Thank you. Yes, please. Francois, uh, I have a question. My question is focused on maize. How is the only thing I care now? <laughs> so, maize <laughs> and yield? Uh, maize in terms of bushels uh, per acre or per hectare. So, uh, John uh, told you with uh, that he made a very important study on correlating biomass in maize and yield. Right? And he showed that he clearly. Sorry, who showed that? Don't do it. Okay. okay. Yeah. Master being pioneer, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's right there. But um, he shows, I think, with, you know, very, very good evidence. There is a very uh, close correlation between biomass uh, and plants and, and yield, uh, yeah. in terms of, of year. Yeah. yeah. And uh, of course, this was a study made uh, across a hundred years with uh, uh, tons of uh, different hybrids. Yeah. The problem is now, the, the key question is that we are interested is in, in, the, in the yield at the year level, right? So, and this is, of course, affected by many other things. How well can you, your model, predict that yield when uh, sometimes, you know, uh, if you don't take very detailed analysis of this, even if moisture, if one point of moisture can be a difference in uh, five bushels per acre in a high yield uh, hybrid, and that could, uh, could be the difference between a, a winner and a loser. Yeah. So, I mean, I think this modeling and the, the chambers are, are very useful you know, for uh, remote sensing to predict maybe the, the yield from a core region. But when you get to that level of resolution, can your model predict that level of resolution? Uh, the answer is essentially yes, essentially. Now, knowing that uh, the models are simplified uh, situations, that uh, can you, you see something because the resolution is good. Usually, you can have a temporal resolution of uh, one to an hour, if you like. So it's not a problem to say. The question is, do I put the right equations in my model? And this is the question that any modeler should ask him again and again and again. I, saw, I see this uh, huge effect of uh, carbon, blah, blah, blah. But is it really a sensitivity or is it because I put the right equation so I see? So I think essentially the response is yes. At least if you use several models, it's safer. So you, you can uh, see whether it's uh, so model dependent or not. But mm -hmm. testing, I think the only way you can test the type of question you ask across US, across uh, Europe, etc., is to test 100 years and see when is the winner and when is the loser. Because if we know that in uh, 100 uh, experiments it will not be enough. So I think we have no choice. But we have to be very careful in the analysis of the output of the model because it can be wrong. So, the, so the, the answer is that uh, maybe these equations are probably the screening method. Is uh, the most critical thing that you do this kind of money. So you, you, you are aware that a very good uh, breeding company, Pioneer, uh, in investing uh, millions in, in money. So if Pioneer does that, it should be right. <laughs> it is good, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Si no hay más preguntas, para. No sé si queda alguna otra pregunta, una más. No? Bueno, para no retrasar el esquema de tiempos. Agradecemos a François y vamos a ver.